Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. You might have heard me tell you that I have a, a soft spot for doubting Thomas because I find so much of myself in him. Well, truth be told, I find a lot of myself also in Nicodemus. And I think there's an awful lot of Christians who who can identify with Nicodemus because he wants to believe, he wants to understand, and he comes to the source of understanding, to truth itself, to seek his counsel, to seek God's word. And yet what he hears is unbelievable, and he struggles. Nicodemus, a Pharisee and member of the Sanhedrin, he, he pops up three times in the Gospel of John. The first is here, chapter 3, when he comes to Christ at night. Not necessarily because he was afraid to be seen going to visit Jesus. Not necessarily because he was ashamed of this rabbi. But it was actually a common practice of the rabbis to study the Torah at night when they would not be disturbed. And so what better time to come to the Lord, Pharisee to rabbi, at a time when they would not be disturbed, when they could speak freely. Nicodemus then reappears in chapter 7, where he defends in a, in a manner of speaking Christ before the Sanhedrin, Reminding them that the law requires that a person be heard before being judged. He says, does our law judge a man without first giving him a hearing and learning what he does? And so Nicodemus, in his own way, seeks to defend Christ. At least to assure him a legitimate and honest hearing. And the last time we hear of Nicodemus is in chapter 19, when he comes to Joseph of Arimathea with the burial spices for Christ, a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds in weight. So much more than was necessary. A sign that this is a royal burial. And that is the journey of Nicodemus, his journey of faith. And the church has long counted him as a converted Christian who heard the word and who believed in Jesus Christ. But his struggle through the Gospel of St. John is very much like the struggle of many of us. And our Gospel begins with Nicodemus coming to Jesus at night. Identified as a ruler of the Jews, this indicates that he was a member of the Sanhedrin, the ruling council of Israel in those days. He was also a rabbi, a teacher. And for Jesus, he says, Jesus says, are you the teacher of Israel and do not understand these things? Jesus was not speaking with a novice in theology, but a teacher. And clearly, he was teaching Nicodemus things that Nicodemus had never considered before. Jesus spoke about being born again. Now, the word used in, in the Greek, the word that the Holy Spirit has selected in accommodating himself to the language of the people, it has two meanings. Based on context, it is decided it is, say, we inferred what it should be translated as in the English. It is used sometimes as from above and other times as again. And we can see how Nicodemus might have took what Jesus said, at least at first, because he asks how a man could crawl back inside his mother to be born a second time. Now, this is part of what Jesus wanted Nicodemus to understand, but surely not all of it. The 
common word for this idea, again, is palen in the Greek. It's most commonly used in the New Testament, almost 141 times. But the word Jesus here uses, anothen, it's used 13 times. 13 times in Scripture, and it's translated again only three of those 13 times. Two of them in this gospel alone. Jesus chose that specific word to couple the ideas of rebirth and a birth from above. Both meanings are to be heard. And that really is what baptism is. A second birth, not from the womb, but rather a second birth from above. A birth by water, and by the power and the working of the Holy Spirit. Nicodemus was a good Protestant. He could not imagine what Jesus could have meant, and the only way he could think of birth was natural birth, from the womb of his mother. And that seems to have suited Jesus' teaching intention too, because Jesus then uses that natural illustration, born of the flesh, and the birth from above, Baptism as born of the Spirit. He teaches us that we are inadequate as we come from the womb. We are inadequate to see the kingdom of God. And this is the witness of Scripture in general, as is often discussed. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 says, But a natural man... The way a person is when they come from the womb, untouched by God in any special way, does not accept the things of the Spirit of God. They are foolishness to him, and he cannot understand them because they are spiritually discerned. Romans 8 also says, Because the mind set on the flesh is hostile toward God, for it does not subject itself to the law of God, for it is not even able to do so. And again, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Therefore I make known to you that no one speaking by the Spirit of God says Jesus is accursed, and no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. The reason that we need birth from above is our spiritual condition as those born of the flesh. As Ephesians chapter 2 says, You were dead in your trespasses and sins. Dead. Unable to move, think, breathe, act. Paul also calls us children of wrath, just like the rest. Dead in your transgressions before the Spirit has made you alive together with Christ working life in you by the new birth in holy baptism. And this is what Paul is getting at in Romans 6. Or do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? Therefore we have been buried with him through baptism into death, in order that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. These words of Romans 6 also remind us of the reason this birth is called born again. We are buried with Christ by baptism into his death. That is, we literally die with Christ. Spiritually, then, we are raised then to a new life, dead to sin and alive to to God in Christ. And this is a real death. A real rebirth. And real everlasting life in Christ Jesus. That's also why St. Peter says that it is worse for a man to fall away once he has tasted the goodness of the Lord 
It is better to never have known than to know and turn away from Christ. Jesus indeed answers all the modern objections to the doctrine of the sacramental power of baptism when he speaks to Nicodemus. Nicodemus cannot fathom how these things can be. And Jesus tells him simply, trust God. Know that the Holy Spirit can do far more than you can possibly imagine. The wind blows where it wishes and you hear the sound of it, but do not know where it comes from. And where it is going, so is everyone who is born of the Spirit. And Jesus tells this to Nicodemus in the context that you must be born of water and spirit. He even chides Nicodemus a little. Are you the teacher of Israel and do not understand these things? Truly, truly, or literally in the Greek, Amen, amen. I say to you, we speak that which we know and bear witness to that which we have seen, and you do not receive our witness. If I told you earthly things and you do not believe, how shall you believe if I tell you heavenly things? You see, if anyone should have been able to understand these things, it should have been Nicodemus. Nevertheless, He did not. And if there is anyone that should understand these things, it should be the Christian. Nevertheless, there are many who do not. What the words of Jesus mean, basically, is that we should not trust our wisdom, our powers of reason in matters theological, but trust and depend on the word of God alone. Sola Scriptura. What God's Word tells us is true. It means just what it says, even when it doesn't make sense. And the word for spirit and the word for wind in Greek are exactly the same. So when Jesus describes the wind and says that you hear it and you see its results, but you don't know from whence it comes, or where it is going, he's describing a common human experience. And of course, with the Weather Channel or the Weather app on your phone, people might think that they know about the wind, and surely they do, in a sense. But the message is still unchanged. Just as the wind goes where it goes, without our permission, without our understanding, we simply experience it. So, too, with the Spirit of God. But Jesus doesn't actually say that. He says, so everyone who is born of the Spirit. Like wind, we cannot see the Holy Spirit, but only see some of what he is accomplishing. We cannot always tell what he is doing. We certainly can't control where he will go next. So, too, we cannot predict who will become a Christian or who God will use or even how. All we can do is experience what the Spirit is doing, what He is working in those around us. Sometimes we think that we've made a good confession and yet the hearers just cannot accept what we say. At other times we think we've said everything wrong and yet... They hear the word, and the Spirit works in them. And they are moved by the Spirit to work powerfully and effectively where the Lord has called them and placed them. It's not under our control how all that we do and say works. And it's not really our work, actually. It is God's. And He promises He promises to work through baptism. All of this, you don't understand how it works, talk is for Nicodemus. It's talk about baptism, and Luther puts it this way. How can water do such great things? It is not the water indeed that does them, but the Word of God 
which is in and with the water, and faith, which trusts that word of God in the water. For without the word of God, it is just plain water and not baptism. But with the word of God, it is a baptism that is a gracious water of life, the washing of regeneration and renewal in the Holy Spirit. As St. Paul tells us in Titus chapter 3, He saved us not by deeds which we have done in righteousness, but according to his mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. Who you are is the work of God. Who you are is through your baptism. And your life sense in the word in your life since then, in the Lord's Supper. You didn't make it happen. God did that. And you're not really in charge of what you'll be doing next. You can decide about coffee or cookies after service today. But God has your life in His plans. Your life in His hands. Meanwhile, your life in Christ is the plan of the Father the gift of the Son, the work of the Holy Spirit. And this birth from above is not the result of any decision you make, because then it's a work and not a gift. It is the gift of God. That is baptism. And it is not merely an as if you were born again, but a true birth which we do not perceive with our senses, but hear only in His Word. In your baptism, you were clothed with Christ. Your sins were washed away. You were made righteous, declared righteous, and given a good conscience towards God through the work of Jesus. But these are not merely what we think or how it feels, but truths revealed by God's Word. And this new birth makes you who were dead alive and promises that sin shall no longer be your master. For you are not under the law, but under grace. It is not a ceremony without power or a symbolic rite, but the very power of God at work in you to bring you to Christ, to guide you into holiness of life both growing and imputed. It is, it is the sine qua non, the fancy Latin that means an essential condition, a fundamental reality about your Christian life. Jesus says, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Without this work of God in you, cannot be a child of God. Your doing it doesn't earn anything. It receives. It receives the promise of God. So do not fear. This precious gift is already yours. It was given to you in your baptism. And to you given. You have been born from above. Your life is no longer centered here in the things of the flesh, the things of this world, but is now centered in He who makes you alive, He who dwells in you and you in Him. Your life is centered in Christ Jesus. And your family is no longer simply those connected to your flesh by genetics, your family is those who have been born in Christ by baptism. The new family, the household of God. You are truly children of God in Christ, both by adoption and by the new birth from above. Don't ask how it can be or why you cannot feel it. Just know that the Spirit works where He chooses and He indeed 
has chosen you with the outcome that you have everlasting life in Christ Jesus. And even if it seems hard to comprehend, if we want to say, hang on, how can you crawl back into your mother's womb? Think about the Holy Trinity, a great mystery of the faith, a Holy Trinity whose work is this great thing. God is in His own being beyond our ability to uh, understand, to comprehend, to grasp, even when He tells us about Himself. And so why should we be able to understand all that He is able to do? Just take Jesus at His word. Baptism is a birth from above. That which is born of the Spirit is Spirit. And may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.